Shalom. We are now in the month of Mar Cheshvan. The month of Cheshvan, known as Mar Cheshvan, denotes a certain formality or distance. Mar is the same word. It's used for mister or even bitter, bitterness. The month of Cheshvan is a bit distant, a bit formal, perhaps a little bit bitter. It's the only month of the entire year that doesn't feature any observances, any holidays, not even a communal fast day. The month of Mar Cheshvan is devoid of any sort of opportunity for action-oriented special seasonal commandments. And especially coming on the heels of the month of Tishrei, this void, this vacuum of action-oriented holiday observances seems very strange because the month of Tishrei was so overflowing, so packed to capacity with special occurrences, special observances, the High Holy Days, the blowing of the Shofar, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot with the Sukkah and the four species, Simcha Torah, dancing with the Torah, and then suddenly, after we were taken from this very brink of excitement and enthusiasm and involvement and movement and action and vibrancy, we're kind of poised on this abyss and come into Mar Cheshvan, just devoid. And some say, well, isn't it great that we have a break from all that, all that action of Tishrei, all those festive meals, all that visiting, all that family and company, we need a little bit of a breather. That's a bit of a silly way to look at it. What really is this story with Mar Cheshvan? What is the secret? We know every time of year has a special tikkun, a special rectification, a special cosmic theme that corresponds with many other ideas and concepts in the mind of God, as it were, in the divine blueprints of creation. And every month broadcasts to us a special kind of theme for our own participation with the unfolding cosmic drama that is our relationship with Hashem. So what is it that we do know about the month of Mar Cheshvan? Well, ultimately, most famously, the month of Mar Cheshvan is the month of the great flood in the time of Noah. It's the time when the decree against all humanity and in fact the entire world was made and sealed. A mere ten generations from Adam to Noah, God, who originally saw everything that he created and behold it was very good, God ultimately, as it were, was so disappointed that he was, as the verses indicate, filled with regret that he even created man after all and found it necessary to destroy the entire world with the water of the flood. So that decree was sealed in the month of Mar Cheshvan, and we read in the Torah and the portion of Noah that on the 17th day of the month of Mar Cheshvan, the waters began to descend upon the earth. So in a way, we can think about the month of Mar Cheshvan as being a time of retribution, a time of punishment, a time of judgment, harsh dinim. And in this very month when we begin to ask for rain in our prayers, this is the rainy season, the blessing of rain for the land of Israel because you see water is synonymous with faith. This is a very deep secret in the Torah that the same water which testifies to the very creation of the world, the oldest elements, the very blessing of our faith in Hashem is also the same element that is the vehicle for retribution and punishments. So as we are living our lives during this month of Cheshvan, on the background there is a certain realization that this is the time of the harsh decree against the generation of the flood, a time of destruction. That doesn't sit very well, that doesn't feel very good. This is a time of, of retribution. What does that mean for us today? Interestingly, we also know one of the outstanding, one of the only outstanding practical aspects of the month of Cheshvan in our calendar is the fact that it is the time of the, of the matriarch Rachel. The 11th day of Cheshvan is the day of the passing of the matriarch Rachel. And this is also an element perhaps woven into the, the consciousness, the cognizance of the whole month that 
um, consolation that we read about in Jeremiah 31, that God assured Rachel that in fact her children will eventually return to their borders. So on the one hand we have this idea of retribution, the harsh decree against the generation of the flood, and in fact the execution of that decree, the destruction of the world in the time of Noah, and yet this background of, of the influence, as it were, the feeling of the presence of, of the matriarch Rachel and her tears for her children. So, bearing all of this uh, in mind, there's one other idea about the, Mar the month of Mar Cheshvan, which is a very fascinating tradition that we've spoken about previously that our sages emphasize. And maybe we can find a connection between these things and realize yet a new level of meaning inherent in the, the wisdom, the teaching of our sages, and a message for us today for this month of Mar Cheshvan. So we read in the Midrash a famous idea that when Moses originally completed the tabernacle in the desert, he oversaw the construction of the tabernacle and the work was completed in the month of Kislev. However, God commanded Moses to wait another few months and not to dedicate the tabernacle, not to consecrate it until the following month of Nisan. And, states the Midrash, the month of Kislev was embarrassed at having been uh, skipped over. The month of, Kis of Kislev said, what, I don't count? You finished the Mishkan, you finished the tabernacle in me, but yet you're not going to be dedicating it in my time? You're going to wait until Nisan? So the month of Kislev, whatever this means, was embarrassed. And God, says the Midrash, paid back the month of Kislev. God rewarded the month of Kislev in the future by seeing to it that the dedication of the second temple in the time of the Maccabees, famous Chashmonayim priests, the story of Hanukkah, second temple was rededicated in the time of the Chashmonayim during the month of Kislev. So, states the Midrash, this is the way that God paid back, as it were, the embarrassment, the hurt feelings of the month of Kislev at having been stepped over in the time of the tabernacle. God assured it and in fact saw to it that the dedication of the second temple was rededicated at the time of Hanukkah during the month of Kislev. And then the Midrash continues and tells us that the, the first holy temple that was built by King Solomon was actually finished during this very month of Mar Cheshvan. In fact, the verse in the Book of Kings tells us that it was finished during the month of Bul, which is the actual original Hebrew name for this month. However, as in the first instance that we learned about, as in the instance of the tabernacle, the month of Mar Cheshvan was stepped over, and although Solomon finished the construction of the first temple in the month of Mar Cheshvan, by divine inspiration, by prophetic enlightenment, he realized, God instructed him, that he was not to dedicate it until the following month of Tishrei. So, the, f the first temple was not activated for almost a year, 11 months, from Cheshvan to Tishrei. And here again, the Midrash states that the month of Mar Cheshvan was embarrassed. And states the Midrash, God will pay back the month of Mar Cheshvan. He assures the month of Cheshvan that he will see to it that the dedication of the third temple will take place during it, during the month of Mar Cheshvan, and that will be the payback. So this Midrash is very beautiful, perhaps very moving, obviously allegorical, somewhat perhaps whimsical. What is it that we are referring to? Is a unit of time like a month, like a human being that can be embarrassed? Is this just some idea that conveys to us that we have to be extraordinarily sensitive people? And if we're sensitive to a month, which is not a person, how much more so shall we ingrain in ourselves the capacity to remember to always be sensitive to people? Well, obviously there is a very deep message here that's being conveyed to us by this beautiful tradition. And of course, if the month of um, Cheshvan is ready, according to this Midrash, for the dedication of the Third Temple. That should not mean that it can't be done any other month. I'll take any month. If we're ready, I'll be very, very happy to see the dedication of the Third Temple. We don't have to wait for the following Mar Cheshvan if it doesn't take place now. But what is really the idea here? Because no words of our sages are simply allegorical for their own sake. They never, they never come back empty. They always have some sort of message 
for us to take home something very practical and a very important practical, prudent application for our understanding of the very stuff of our lives on a daily basis. So here, you know, actually, when we think about it, there is a very deep connection between these two themes that seem to be prevalent, that seem to be somehow honing, refining, and, and characterizing the very nature of the month of Mar Cheshvan. And so the question is, what, in fact, is the, is the connection between the fact that this is the time of the retribution, the punishment, the destruction of the Great Flood, and also the time of promise, the time of redemption, the time when God assures us we will see the dedication in the future of the Third Temple. Really, when we think about it, we can find a very beautiful thread that connects these two ideas. Because the very idea of the destruction of the flood, why did it come about? What was the, the major predominant character trait that is described by our sages that apply to the people of that generation. What was the problem? Why did God find it necessary to destroy the world? And we read in the verses in the book of Noah that the waters of the flood were so high that they covered over the highest mountain in the world by 15 amot, and that they sunk down into the, into the earth three tzfachim below the surface of the earth. In other words, the water was so comprehensive that it covered over the highest place and sunk down to lower than the lowest place, to make sure that everything was totally consumed by this retribution. Our sages tell us that the generation of the flood was a generation of total chaos, of total licentiousness, of total anarchy, a generation that cared nothing for, for anyone that, whose, whose very theme was just immediate self-gratification and a desire to uproot the divine image from humanity and a desire not to take any personal responsibility. Personal responsibility, of course, we always emphasize is the very basis of a Torah lifestyle. And their goal was just to rest and relax and do whatever comes naturally, which of course led to things that weren't even natural at all. And basically, in a manner of speaking, their banner, their statement was, we don't want God in the world. We don't want to hear about this God thing. We don't want to be reminded and told that we were created in the divine image and therefore we have a responsibility to upkeep the world. Please leave us alone. No God here. A godless world. That's what they wanted. And that was the reason why even though God had saw that indeed creation was very good, that was the reason why he realized this has to start all over again because the very foundation of creation, the very purpose of creation, our sages tell us in a very, very pithy and succinct and perfect definition. It's the old statement that comes from the Midrash Tanchuma. What was the reason for creation in the first place? It's the very theme of the Holy Temple. The reason that God created the world in the first place is because he desired a dwelling place, an abode in this lowly world even though he has the heavens and the heavens of heavens and all the celestial worlds and countless spheres of angels and ethereal concepts, he wants this physical world. He wants this lowly world. He wants us. He wants to be involved in this world, and that is the sanctification of his name. When we can live in this world and uplift everything to his purpose and realize that there is a God here and welcome him, that's the purpose of creation. And of course, those people, the generation of the flood, wanted to divest that divine image, and they didn't want God here at all. God says, I want a dira v'tachtonim, I want an abode in the lower world. They said, not here, no thank you. Thanks, but no thanks. And this idea of God having an abode here below is embodied by the Holy Temple. In fact, if you want an example of what it means for God to have an abode in this world, you can't get a better example than the concept of the Holy Temple. The Holy Temple is a statement that we welcome God into this world and that we will fixate on God being in this world. We won't deny it, but that we will concentrate all of our efforts around the fact that every day, at every moment, God is in this world and we will live for Him. And so how beautiful that our sages tell us that in this very month, the month of retribution, the month 
that was characterized by that generation that didn't want God in the world, didn't want God to have an abode, and was subsequently punished. This is the very month that holds in it the promise of the dedication of the third temple, which is, of course, the rectification of all humanity, the promise of redemption for the whole world. And so whether or not it takes place in this month is not really the issue. The issue is that our sages emphasize to us that hidden, latent, within the very worst possible time is really the best possible time, and that no generation is beyond hope. So we'll take the dedication of the Third Temple whenever it's ready. May it be this month of Mar Cheshvan or some other time whenever we're ready. But largely, don't forget that it is up to us. And if we rectify the sin of the generation of the Flood, and if we see to it that we are happy to live according to the divine image and that we're happy to welcome God into this world and we see to it that the world does become an abode for the divine presence down below, then surely we'll also merit through our action to see the dedication of the third temple in this very month of Mar Cheshvan.